Phil Clark. He is a professor of international politics at SOAS University of London. Great to have you on the program, Professor Clark. How big of a player in the Rwandan genocide was Kabuga? Kabuga was absolutely central to the genocide and in the sense that he was one of Rwanda's uh, wealthiest businessmen. Uh, he, in many ways, bankrolled the entire genocide. Uh, he enabled the creation of the Hutu militias that carried out many of the biggest massacres during the genocide. Uh, he funded the hate radio station that uh, incited so many people to, to engage uh, in, in the violence. And he also assisted uh, importing about 500,000 machetes into the country, uh, without which the genocide would have been impossible. So Kabuga is absolutely central to, to the way the genocide played out. He eluded capture for 26 years. How was he able to do this? Was he given safe harbor by the French government over the years? Rachel, this is one of the biggest questions in the Kabuga episode is how was he able to stay on the run for so long? We know that uh, he spent a lot of those 26 years uh, in Kenya. He had very uh, close links to the Kenyan government, but it does look like he spent the last five or six years in France. We know that Kabuga always had very close ties to the French government. Uh, he was very close, especially to the Mitterrand uh, regime. Uh, he's very close uh, to various elite uh, military and political players in France. And the big question at the moment is uh, how much did French officials know about Kabuga and, and, and how much did they actively keep him safe uh, in the country while there were various international arrest warrants out for him? You know, the genocide has long cast a shadow over Franco-Rwandan relations. What does this arrest mean for relations between the two countries? We've seen improving relations between Rwanda and France in the last couple of years. Uh, in 2018, there was a very important summit between President Macron and, and President Kagame. I think many people saw that as a, a thawing of relations. Of course, Rwanda accuses France of uh, deep complicity in the genocide, um, that the French government provided support to those uh, Hutu militias. They armed and trained the inter uh, militias. Rwanda would like to see France admit uh, to, to that role and for there to be some sort of accountability. I think the fact that French authorities have cooperated in the arrest of Kabuga indicates that, generally speaking, those uh, relations between France and, and Rwanda are improving. But from Rwanda's point of view, and until France really comes to terms with its role in the 1994 genocide, um, that, that relation will not have fully healed. Right. Uh, Kabuga is expected to be uh, taken to the International Criminal Court at The Hague. But is there a possibility he could be brought to trial in Rwanda? And if so, what impact could that have for it to take place there? So, in fact, he'll be handed over to the uh, the, the residual mechanism for the, the UN uh, Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. So not the ICC, but the, the institution that came after the UN Tribunal for Rwanda, which was based in Tanzania. The big fight now will be whether the UN keeps jurisdiction over the Kabuga case or whether we end up seeing Kabuga prosecuted in Kigali. Um, already there are noises out of Rwanda that authorities in, in Kigali are going to push for a a prosecution um, of Kabuga domestically. Um, and I think that's very important. To see Kabuga prosecuted in Kigali would be very similar to the prosecution of Eichmann in, in Jerusalem in terms of the, the impact that that case would have. To hold it uh, in a courtroom where the victim, the, the survivors of the genocide can, can witness that trial firsthand um, would have a much greater effect than seeing him prosecuted in, in some distant uh, UN courtroom. So, so there's uh, a, a big uh, jurisdictional fight looming in the next couple of weeks to determine what happens to Kabuga now. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much, Professor Phil Clark.